Bueno, gente, vamos a arrancar en nombre de, del Departamento de Potencia y de la IEEE, capítulo de Potencia, Implementación y Medidas, un placer organizar esta actividad. Básicamente, ahora eh, Andrés les va a presentar a Marc. Eh, esto lo hacemos como parte de nuestra tarea rutina. Y la verdad que es un honor eh, tener aquí al profesor Mark Halting. Eh, Mark está dirigiendo el doctorado de Andrés, por tanto, capaz que Andrés es el que mejor puede hacer la presentación de Mark y ya este, arrancamos con la conferencia. Así que, Andrés, te paso la palabra. Gracias. Eh, les voy a presentar a Mark en inglés, y yo soy el que en esta presentación. Mark creo que entiende mejor de también que yo pinté, pero en el ámbito de nuestro dictado en inglés lo voy a hacer. Igual por el público que tenemos, tranquilo con hacerlo en español, porque no tenemos nadie que hable inglés, así que ni te gasto. Ah, pero más para que Mark que Mar, que entienda más. Ah, perfecto. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this event. I'm the secretary of the local chapter, the local section of ITRFD here in Uruguay. And I'm glad to be here with you to present this lecture. Today, Professor Mark Baldwin is going to talk about power quality standards and recent changes in ITRFD power quality standards. First of all, I would like to say thank you to my colleague, my friend, Professor Mark Halpin for accepting my invitation to give this lecture for us today. And I would like to also say thank you to our president, the president of our session, Gonzalo Rasaravilla, for giving the opportunity to organize this event. Before Professor Halpin starts his presentation, allow me to introduce him to you. Professor Halpin received his degree in electrical engineering from the University of Auburn in Alabama in the US and his PhD from the, of electrical engineering from the same college, the same university. He has worked as a head of several technical groups of IEEE, IEC, and CBRE, developing power quality standards, doing research, and proposing new methods about how to assess how to assess, sorry, flicker emission, harmonic emissions, and flicker emissions. So today we have the great opportunity to learn about those topics from an, an expert, a colleague who has a great uh, professional experience. In fact, Professor Kalkin has more than 30 years of experience working on power quality subjects. Um, after Professor Halpin finishes his presentation, there will be time for questions. People who have shown Zoom will be allowed to put their comments and their questions on the chat, and they will be read at the end of the presentation. So, thank you, Mark. It's your time. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. You can start as you wish, my friend. All right. I think probably the best thing is to let's see how do we share the screen. Let me show the video. Okay. There. All right. Excellent. Well, certainly thank you, Andres, for the uh, for the wonderful introduction, and thank you all for the opportunity to to be here. Um, I think this is my third, maybe third, maybe fourth time here in uh, in Uruguay, and it's always always. Uh, enjoyable to come indeed it's a long way from from usa but with a good friend uh, like andres it's always my pleasure to come the fact that we share common technical interests just makes it easier no, oh, no. Right. no problems So anyway, the Andres talked to me when we were considering uh, 
me coming again, he, he talked to me about the things that are taking place in IEEE and also IEC as far as standardization is concerned. As he mentioned, I have been involved with standardization for many, many years. I, today, in more recent times, most of my involved, involvement has been with IEC and cigarette. Uh, certainly, I'm, I continue to be involved in, in IEEE for obvious reasons with, the, with my home in, in USA. Of course, IEEE is the applicable standards organization for, for North America. But Andres asked me to talk about the IEEE power quality standards. Uh, certainly, that's what we're going to do. But if there are questions or issues that you would like to discuss as we go that are more relevant to IEC, we can certainly do that. I, as I'm sure you know, there is this much printed material as far as power quality standards are concerned. I have 30 PowerPoint slides for this much. So there, I'm trying to give an overview. I'm trying to highlight certain things. If there's something that you want to ask, please, please ask. Ask. Don't wait until the end. Uh, we can ask the questions. If I can't answer it based on the slides, you know, well, we, I sure. Eh, los que están en remoto, ¿se están viendo la presentación o están viendo la, 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 la cámara? La cámara. Ah, está. Hay que hacer el share. La cámara sale bárbaro. No creo que vean nada. Pueden ver la presentación ahora. ahora. That should be better. Okay. Los demás la ven ahora haciendo todo. Espectacular. Y lo pueden ver en la cámara también. Ok, but anyway, so if you have questions, ask the questions as we go along. If you need to, then no problem. So uh, this, these slides are intended to stimulate questions and discussion rather than give all of the answers or all the information. So when I think about power quality, the way from the perspective of the company that I work for, it is true. I am a professor of engineering and I probably spend one day per month at university. Most of the work I do is for the utility company in my state, which is Alabama Power Company. Uh, it is a, a member of what is known as the Southern Electric System, which is a regional utility company in the Southeastern United States. So it's a big utility company. So when we think about from the utility perspective, in, in our company, when we think about power quality management, it, this is kind of the, the high level overview. We recognize that in our system, there are many different types of disturbances that generally combine to create what we might call power quality problems. Our system, any system, it can have one particular type of disturbance. It can have them all. There's no way to know. Well, is that necessarily a bad thing? Maybe not. A long time ago, nobody knew anything about power quality. No, none of us thought about power quality until in, in USA, until the microwave oven. A, a microwave oven. What does that have to do with power quality? We begin to notice stacks because digital clock 
on the oven would go back to zero, zero, zero. And we began to have equipment that was sensitive. In, in that early case, the sensitivity was, was the sags or, or short-term outages. Before that, we, we didn't care. The system still had those problems, but we didn't have any connected in-use equipment that was sensitive to them. Nowadays, I, we have a huge variety of different kinds of in-use equipment. A particular in-use piece of equipment could be sensitive to one thing or multiple things. Every piece of in-use equipment is different. The disturbances, where do they come from? Well, they could come from the system itself. The in-use equipment could produce it, or the disturbances could come from some kind of natural effect. Okay, right? so this is this is this is our environment. This is reality that we have to deal with. So how do we go about trying to manage power quality? We try and emphasis try because it, it is a continuous ongoing effort. Power quality is in, in English, we talk about job security. We always have work in power quality. It never ends because we can never solve the problem. The problem is always changing. But that's why it's, it has to be a statistical distribution. If it were one piece of equipment, we could have one specific definition of sensitivity. But the power system is full of different kinds of end use equipment. Each one of them has a different characteristic as far as sensitivity is concerned. If we want to effectively operate our power system, we have to provide a quality product for all of them. And that's the challenge. Okay. We try to characterize the, the response characteristics of our equipment. Then we try to manage the sources of the different disturbances with the ultimate objective of matching the quality of our product, which at the end of the day is a voltage, to match the quality of our product with the sensitivities of the end use equipment. That's our, that's our ultimate objective in words. It's a little easier when we think about the, the, the problem that we're facing in terms of disturbances in the system and sensitivities of equipment. And let's start with, with this plot. Let's start with the graphic on the left. So here we have a representative statistical distribution that describes the level of some particular disturbance. Now, we could be talking about a harmonic disturbance, non-balanced disturbance, sag disturbance, voltage fluctuation disturbance. There are lots of different kinds of disturbances. So we could develop a statistical distribution of the severity of those disturbances. Sometimes we have, for example, high levels of harmonics, sometimes we have low levels of harmonics. It varies over time and space. So we think about a statistical distribution of the disturbance levels. Now, that voltage, which contains that disturbance, again, is supplied to a range of end use products. Each one has a different sensitivity level. So we think about a statistical distribution of sensitivities of end use equipment. So, we have a distribution of disturbances and a distribution of sensitivities. If we keep the disturbances and sensitivities apart, life is good. But it costs money to do this. Every millimeter of separation we achieve costs money. Conceptually, 
If we spent infinite money, then we can move those distributions far enough apart that there would be no disturbance level that ever exceeded a, a susceptibility value. But we can't spend infinite money. There will be overlap. And that really defines our job, managing somehow the overlap between disturbance levels and what we normally consider and call immunity levels of equipment. So how do we go about managing this overlap? You know, because it's not possible to spend infinite money. You can't do that. There will be overlap. How do we go about managing? Well, we accept, we accept outright that there will be some level of power quality problems. We cannot fix them all, right? Each, each company, each regulator, each region, each country makes their own decisions, right? With regard to how much overlap we're willing to accept. So what we tend to do is we tend to talk about different quantities to quantify different places on these statistical distributions. What we want to do is we want to recognize that our utility company and our voltage product, right, is influenced by all those different possible sources of the disturbances. They all combine together. So we have to manage all of them so that we keep the level to some comfortable, acceptable quality. That's a decision that we make. How much risk are we willing to accept? Right? And we call that level of a particular disturbance that we're willing to accept, our target, if you will. We refer to that as a planning level. And what we want to do is we want to plan and operate our power system so that the cumulative effects of all the disturbances acting together bring us to that target. So if we pick the target level more to the left, then we're creating less chance, less likelihood of overlap. So we're making positive steps, taking positive actions to reduce the overlap, to reduce the risk, right? So our target level is what we call a planning level. Now, we also talk about what we call a compatibility level. That is the point at which we believe that the level of disturbance and the level of susceptibility match. Right? That's the intersection of these statistical distributions that we're willing to accept. Right? So why is our target below the level that we're willing to accept? This is what we're willing to accept. So why is our target less than that? Is the planning and operating target? Is the power system right now, at this moment, the same as it was at this minute yesterday? No, it changed. Will it be different tomorrow? Of course it will. It always moves. Well, how do we plan for something that's always changing? That's called uncertainty. Right? And so to manage uncertainty, we pick a target that is below what we're willing to accept. That way, if we make a mistake, if something changes, then we're still okay. So we tend to plan for disturbance levels that are lower than what we're actually willing to accept because of uncertainty. There are things out there that we can't control that we don't know. And so we leave some margin. All right. Okay, well, so if this concept of planning level or our target, if that's for the entire power system, remember, our voltage product is influenced by everything connected to the system. Every user, every piece of equipment contributes to that disturbance level. 
we need to control or manage that total level by assigning to each individual user some portion of that disturbance level. So if we think about a planning level as a target, this is the sum total of all of the network users. So each individual network user down to the level of each individual end use piece of equipment, each individual thing is a very small piece of that total. Thinking about this from the traditional utility perspective, I, I, operate, a, I operate a network. My network has customers. All those customers together impact the quality of the voltage. I'm going to allow each individual user some portion of that. It's up to me from a power quality management perspective to decide how to do that. Right? That's a challenging problem. And that's really the motivation behind having standards, best practices, and, and established recommendations. We're not starting from zero. There's a huge body of experience at this point. And for the next hour or so, we're going to talk about the IEEE version of that. Right. So that's kind of the background of, of, of our discussion. How do we maximize the operation of all the connected equipment so that we can achieve an acceptable level of power quality. Recognizing, again, that now let's come to this graphic. Recognizing that over time, certainly the disturbance levels are moving always. Right? They're always moving. So somehow we have to capture these effects that is managing power quality. The philosophy is to allow every user some share of the total so that when all the users acting together over time produce some varying disturbance level, how do we make sure that we keep this time profile at or below some supposedly acceptable level? Right? That's our challenge. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> How do we go about doing that? Well, the way we do it is going to depend on what the disturbance is, right? But like I've said before, we're not acting alone, right? There's a, a huge amount of existing literature that guides. It is the best practices are to the point now where it's not just a good idea to do something, it's okay to standardize on it. Let's, let's say, we're, let's all do this. You know, I always use this example to so that people can appreciate standardization. When it, it's, a, it's a good idea, it really is a good idea for me to be able to get on the airplane in the USA and, and come here to your way and for my computer to be able to connect to the Wi-Fi in the hotel. That's a good idea. Well, it would be a good idea if the Wi-Fi adapter in my tablet would could work with the Wi-Fi in the hotel. That that's a good idea. You know, that's such a good idea. Is let's make it a standard. Okay. Let's have everybody doing the same thing. It's such a good idea. We're so confident in it. It is so important that let's let everybody do it. Okay. Let's standardize on it. So standards are things that we all really, really, really agree with. All right. But well, there. I think that there's some things with regard to power quality that yeah, we, we think we should do certain things, but we're not quite so confident. All right? So there's maybe another layer of experience that's below standards. All right? And in IEEE, we have two levels below standards. 
We have what we call recommended practices, and we have what are called guidelines. Okay. Now, IEC is a little different. IEC is the other major manufacturer or major producer of these types of, of standards. Okay. Of course, IEC has standards. IEC has technical reports, and a lot of these things that apply to power quality from the utility perspective are technical reports, right? And IEC has what are called technical specifications, right? So both IEEE and IEC have different levels of documents. But if you're not careful, you will hear people, and I do it too, we all just say, ah, oh, this is standard. You know, this is like IEEE standard, whatever. I'll show you in a minute an example of the difference between IEEE standard and IEEE recommended practice. But if people talk about it, we're just, if you were to ask me, I would say, oh, IEEE standard 1100, but it's not a standard at all. Okay, there, there are differences in these levels. Now, I don't know the situation here in Uruguay. In the U.S., a standard almost, but not quite, almost carries the weight of law, but not quite. Right? In the Eurozone, standards carry the weight of law. Right? So the word standard can be very important. And I to believe we're kind of loose with that. And you, you'll see that as we go along. So the IC and I to believe are the big producers and coordinators of these recommended practices and standards and guides and so forth. But in general, I to believe and I see they're not necessarily technical organizations. You know, here we are at an IEEE meeting. Are we doing technical work? We're talking about technical things, but we're not doing technical work. And that's that's pretty common, both in IEEE and IEC. Other groups do the technical work. And oftentimes, IEEE and IEC are kind of the administrators the, the managers of the technical work, the publishers, the endorsers, and there are other words like that. So what are some of these other groups? Well, another very active group in the United States is the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI. All right. Uh, in, in the Eurozone, CIGRE and, and CIRED are very active in terms of having groups that do technical development. Right. Uh, there are a lot of others that are that fulfill these same kinds of roles. The, uh, in Canada, there's the Canadian Standards Association. Uh, of course, in the Eurozone, the European Union has established what are called Euro norms, EEN whatever numbers that are different types of, of standards. In most cases, a lot of the questions that you might have or that I might have, we're not the first to think about. It. Other people, people a lot smarter than me, have already thought about it. Okay? And their experiences for 30 years now are collected up in these publications. They exist. Standards, best practices, all these documents, they exist for our benefit. But if we're going to benefit from them, we have to know that they exist, and we have to know where different pieces of information are. And that's kind of our purpose. We're going to focus today a little bit. Obviously, we only have about an hour. But we're going to focus on IEEE publications. Some of the things we're going to talk about are standards. Some of them are recommended practices. None of the ones, the samples that I pulled for today, none of them fall into the guide category, but they certainly exist. <clears throat> so, in no particular order, okay, I, I just picked some, okay, and I've tried to pick some that, that based on my interactions with Andres, I tried to pick ones that I felt would be appropriate for, for you. 
first of all, when when we in in my company, when we think about power quality, we think about power quality from two perspectives. There's the user side of power quality, and there's the utility side of power quality. Now, what what's the difference? Well, from the user side, of, from the user perspective, I think about power quality like I was an electrician and I'm working inside a factory. My job is to keep the machines running. There's all kinds of reasons inside a, 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 a plant that a piece of equipment doesn't work right. Lots and lots and lots of reasons. Okay. That has nothing to do with the quality of the power. If you don't properly wire the conductors to a piece of equipment, if you have loose connections, the equipment's not going to work right. That has nothing to do with the utility quality total. Nothing at all to do with it. But the end use piece of equipment is not working correctly. Right? To some people, especially to the user community, that's they, that's considered to be power quality. The IEEE Emerald Book is dedicated to the user side of power quality. Right now, <clears throat> this is an example of what I was telling you about how we're loose with work. Right here, IEEE standard 1100. Okay. The title is IEEE Recommended Practice. Which one is it? You know, it, it, it's hard to say. Okay. And sometimes it matters. Okay. And it might, that kind of thing might matter more here than it does in the U.S. In the U.S., because none of this quite carries the weight of the law, doesn't really matter. But, for example, in the Eurozone, in the IEC sphere of influence, it does matter. And you would never see something like this. Okay? All right. Nonetheless, I just wanted to point that out and share it with you. Now, the IEEE and the so-called Emerald Book, that's what we call this. It, it, I don't... I guess you could still buy a printed one. If you bought a printed one, it'd be about like this thing. I think it's a thousand pages. I don't remember. It's, it's huge. Okay. It's a bunch of pages. That was, or this was, this was the first IEEE power quality document. Okay. This, this got a start. Now, the last time this document was revised, and published was back in 2005. That's not because there's not any new information. Remember, IEEE as an institution is kind of administrative, okay? There hasn't been a lot of technical power quality work on the user side in a while. Not only that, but this big book, wait a minute. This is 2023. Is anybody going to print a book that big? Who's going to read it? When I first started doing standardization, especially international, you know, I, I would carry a stack of books or papers on the airplane. I should read them. And they were not, you know, I travel relatively lightly and I always carry everything in, in, in a backpack. And I would get to But no, no, no. Now, you know, tablet, you know, we don't need these big books anymore. And that's one of the reasons that the so called Emerald Book, book it, you know, it, it hasn't been revised as a complete thing in a while. It's just too big. All right. But that doesn't mean it's not good stuff. Okay. The nice thing about power quality is it doesn't, the, the stuff that you still apply, it still applies. It, it hadn't changed, it hadn't gone away. So what I tried to do with these as we go through these different these different documents is to show you the document title and then a little a little cut of the table of contents. 
So that way you can see the kind of the topical outline of each document. And then you know, I'll go through and pick out a few things and, and kind of highlight. Okay. But if there if you see something in this list that you I don't talk about and you have a question about by you know, I mean then by all means we'll talk about it. Okay. Obviously. I can't put a thousand pages worth of information in a, a one hour presentation. But the Emerald Book is what got us started. <clears throat> so the, the nice thing about the Emerald Book, it was developed by the user community for the user community. Okay. Now, IEEE, as far as, let's say, power and energy is concerned, IEEE really has two different groups. Now, I, I understand that we're, what we are doing here today is a part of the Power and Energy Society. Right? And that is certainly a big part of the IEEE power arena. But there's another part. And the other part is the IEEE Industry Application Society. That's where the users are. The Power and Energy Society is where the utilities are. Okay? The Emerald Book was developed by the user community in the IEEE Industry Application Society. It was developed by the user community, and it addresses power quality from the perspective of the user. And it's for the users, right? It's the only one of the IEEE documents that's like that. All the rest of them that we're going to talk about were developed by the Power and Energy Society. That's not a good or a bad thing, but that means all the rest of them that we're going to talk about were developed by the utility companies for the utility companies. Okay, so different perspectives all on these different documents. So in the Emerald Book, the focus was on the different kinds of things that need to be considered so that an end-use piece of equipment can operate effectively in the industrial environment. What are those things? Well, we have to think about the characteristics of, of the power supply, okay, the utility company, in other words. We have to think about how our end-use piece of equipment is interconnected to its source of energy. That obviously is a potential source of difficulty. And we have to think about the effective and safe operation, including control of the load. Right? And one of the major issues that brings up is the simple thing called ground. Right? So those are kind of the big broad categories of, of things that are in the Emerald Book. But it's important to recognize that the Emerald Book was our first one from an, across IEEE. This was our first power quality effort as far as making a standard was concerned. See, I just did making a standard, but it's a recommended practice. Okay? Don't, don't let that bother you. We've had this book for a long time, okay? We've had this book way longer than, especially in the utility industry, we've been worried about things like IEEE 519 or you know IEC quicker severity or any of those things. The Emerald Books and the concepts in it have been around a long time, okay? What we think about and tend to focus on today is really just a little piece of the Emerald Book. So this is the perspective of the Emerald Book. How do I get that end use piece of equipment, whatever it might be, how do I get that thing to function as, as for its intended purpose? Well, what all could happen to it? Well, I could have problems in the utility supply, Okay, the problems could be associated with the utility supply. They could be associated with some natural phenomenon. I certainly could have things like short circuits, okay, that I can't do anything at all about, right? 
the operation of other parallel loads, whether they're in the utility or whether they're in the same facility. These operational characteristics could influence and affect that load. Certainly, I have to deal with things like not just conducted electromagnetic problems. I have to think about radiated potential sources of problems. The grounding system is critical when it comes to proper operation of this kind of load. And of course, nowadays, everything is connected somehow by data, right? Maybe, now let's see now, two and a half years ago, two and a half years ago, during COVID, two and a half years ago, I decided I, to move my house. I moved to a different house. And I, it just so happened that the house I moved into, it was, it was a new house. And it was a smart house. The electrodomestics in my house, they're smart. So my clothes washing machine is smart. I can sit and with the phone app, I can manage my clothes washing machine. I hope that our cybersecurity friends don't figure out how to hack my phone app and make my clothes washing machine wash by itself. The point of this is that certain in industrial application, okay, and all those, all of our manufacturing equipment is somehow linked and integrated to some kind of control system. Yes, it's true. In more modern times, more and more and more of that is going wireless. Okay, but it'll be a long time before it all does, if it does. Okay? So much concern over cybersecurity these days, a wire, it's hard to compromise a physical connection. Okay, so that's probably going to stay around a long time. All right, so this. This was the focus and still is the focus of the Emerald Book. It's not simply the quality of the utility supply. This is why most of you are here. Okay? But the Emerald Book and all its thousand pages are devoted to all of this. Okay? There's a lot of good information there. When the Emerald Book was first created 40 years ago, the main problems that were of concern coming from the utility supply was that and that okay over voltages associated with lightning or some kind of switching transient we all understand that damage is equipment that with that we got to manage that from a performance perspective faults we all understand when faults occur it's going to produce sags and sags low enough will disrupt equipment. Those were the two things that the Emerald Book considered about the quality of the utility supply. But that's not what you didn't come here today to learn to hear about that. We take that for granted. Okay? We take that for granted. Now, we think more about things like distortion levels and voltage fluctuation levels and things like that when it comes to utility supply. And that's what you came here to talk about. And you came here or to hear about. And, and today we want to talk about, for example, oh, if my utility supply is no longer consistent, consisting of rotating synchronous machine generators, now my utility supply consists of some kind of inverter-based resource. Those are the things you want to talk about. We'll get there. Okay. This was our first. Okay. In the Emerald Book, voltage disturbances are considered to be one of three kinds. There are voltages, voltage disturbances that are additive. Those tend to be over voltage transients like lightning and switching circuit. There are voltage disturbances which are subtractive. They tend to reduce the supply of voltage. Those are disturbances like SAGs. And 
there are disturbances that are associated with distortion. They don't really change the RMS value much, but they corrupt the mold. Right? So the subtractive and additive disturbances, these tend to increase or decrease the RMS voltage. The distortion category of voltage disturbances doesn't change the RMS value much, but it disrupts the quality. Okay, so these were the three kinds of voltage disturbances that Demo book could consider. So in 1980, this was not really a big problem in general. These, these work. Lightning's been there forever. As long as we've had power systems, they're subject to short circuit faults and therefore sags. Right? So most of the attention in the Emerald Group is on those two categories, just a little bit with harmonics. I like to think about, though, even this Emerald Group as being the IEEE power quality pioneering or originating document. Why? Even though what it focused on was largely SACs. Okay? That's the main traditional power quality focus in the Emerald Group. SAGs are old. How is that? That's, there's nothing exciting about voltage SAG. Why is that the pioneering principle? It's not SAGs. It's the constant. It was the way that we envisioned, and I wasn't involved in it in 1980, right? but the way people envisioned it then is represented in these two graphics. Now, this graphic at the top, you may know, this is the modified version of the so-called Sabima curve. We call this the ITIC curve now. This represents, guess what? The sensitivity of computer electronics to voltage. That's a sensitivity curve. This graphic, Represent gives us a visual indication of the length of voltage sags and the depth of the voltage sag and how often they occur at a particular location in, in a power system. So if we want to ensure power quality, well, we don't have infinite money, right? We can't move them too far apart. What we can do is we can look at the characteristics of the disturbances and the sensitivities of the equipment and get the overlap close enough together that we can accept it. And, and this kind of thinking in 1980, yes, that's pioneer. Today, we kind of take it for granted, right? And today we talk about, oh, well, we talk about planning levels and compatibility levels and limits or harmonics and unbalanced flicker and all these fancy sounding terms. But we're going to do this exact same thing. All right. We started it all in the IEEE world with settings. Right. So it's the philosophy, right? Determine the sensitivity of the equipment come up with what we feel like is an acceptable immunity or boundary level. Assess the conditions of the power supply, the disturbance level. And then let's try to manage our power system this part so that I keep these disturbance levels at or below whatever is necessary so that I don't have problems. Sounds simple. But that was pioneering thinking in 1980, right? We do it all the time now. Okay, so that's that was the user side. Again, there's a ton, a huge amount of technical content in that Emerald book, lots of it. I just wanted to share it with you from the historical perspective, really, to let you know that that's kind of where it started. Okay, so if you if you want if you have to deal with user the user community, the Emerald Book's a good place to go get 
information about stuff in the plant. Oh, all right. What about the utility perspective? If the Emerald Book is the customer perspective, well, what about the utility perspective? And I triple E, we have it now, we have a document that looks at power quality from the utility perspective. And it's IEEE standard now, okay? Now, uh, not in, this is 2018, I say now, we're about to revise 1250 and it's gonna elevate up to a standard. But this is the document that describes power quality from the utility perspective. So from, from the perspective of the utility, what is power quality? What, how do we talk about the quality of the power? Well, we don't, do we supply power? I, I, I don't know. I, I think our product is voltage. We provide a voltage. And when the user connects something to that voltage, current flows and therefore power. But our product, what we deliver, is that voltage. So, when we think about power quality from the utility perspective, we're really thinking about voltage quality. Okay, really thinking about voltage. You know, it's kind of like it, everybody in the utility arena has done a load flow study, right? You know, everybody knows what load flow is. <clears throat> hmm. All right, okay, load flow. Does load load is like what's in my house, right? And, and what's in your house? My my TV or whatever. That's load. I hope my TV load. I hope it doesn't flow anywhere. It just sits there. <laughs> no, my TV is <laughs> power flow. Okay. Well, from the same perspective, we talk about power quality. Is it really power quality? No, no. It's full of ball. That's really what it is. Okay. So, from in the IEEE world, when we think about from the utility perspective, when we think about power quality, it, of course, is voltage quality, and that is captured in IEEE 12D. You can see the little set of the table of contents. Guess what? All right. Well, we got to understand what the system is. We have to think about the power quality the concerns. We got to think about the susceptibility of the lows, and we got to think about what some of the potential solution options are. This is 2018. This is a relatively new document, but isn't this exactly the same list that we went through with the Emerald Book? Define the susceptibility of the equipment characterize the disturbance level, figure out some compromised position. Yes, it's exactly the same uh, philosophical approach. So what's in 1250? What kind of things? Well, again, thinking about it from the utility perspective, there's a whole bunch of different things that we would call power quality problems, okay? or power quality topics. Uh, steady state voltage regulation, that's kind of the, the basic thing. We kind of take that for granted, but we still have to manage it. We have to think about unbalance. We have to think about distortion and in terms of harmonics, usually. We have to think about voltage fluctuations. We have to think about sags and interruptions. We have to think about transients. These are kind of the, these are sort of the mainstream topics. All of these topics are addressed in 12 Okay. In general, for each one of these topics, and this is not all, there's a few others, but these are the big ones. In 1250, each one of these topics is, is described a little bit. Okay. There's some information given about how we're going to assess these different uh, power quality issues, what kind of limits apply, and some examples. So 1250 is kind of a catch-all okay, for all these different topics. Now, when you think about IEEE and you think about harmonics, do you think about a document number <laughs> 1250? I will probably not. 
probably when you think about IEEE and you think about harmonics, you probably think about a document number 519. Okay. So guess what? 1250 is not 1250 is not 519, right? 1250 in this category simply says, okay, if you want to know all about harmonics, go get 519. Here's a little something. Okay. So 1250 has got a little summary. Steady state voltage regulation, unbalanced distortion, flicker, sags, etc. Okay. So it's a great document from the perspective of the utility company. It makes a lot of reference to other detailed documents in each one of these topics. Right? One of the things that is good about 1250 is obviously the susceptibility of end use equipment. That's a critical aspect of power quality. There's there are summaries in 1250 of sensitivity characteristics for, for the major classes of end use equipment, okay? Computers. Now obviously, that generally falls in the category of something like the IJIC curve. We've seen that already. That kind of thing is in 1250. Process control is a little bit different in terms of sensitivity. Telecom is, is sensitive in different ways, right? Electro domestics and consumer electronics, those things are, have different levels of sensitivity. Obviously, adjustable feed drive, that type of power electronic system, it has different kinds of sensitivity. 1250 does not give all of the documentation, all of the research and test, but it gives some. Okay? So it gives good general information. But because 1250 is written by utility engineers for utility engineers, this is all the abuse stuff, okay? So this content is at a higher level. It's a less detailed level. If you guys are working for the utility company, you don't need to be an expert in all this. You need to be aware of it, but not an expert. And that's the, the philosophy, you might say, that's in... 1250, because you've got to understand the perspective of the user. As far as recommendations for mitigation, well, for the most part, there's not a whole lot users can do beyond things like UPS type equipment applications. That's the major thing that an end user can do to ensure the operation of whatever their equipment is. Okay. And so there's a pretty good bit of information in 1250 about UPS. Yes. Why? So, so that you, as the utility company, make recommendations to your end users. All right. So that you can help them. Uh, oh, the internet's not stable. Uh, there's some iron and grounding, a little bit about harmonic filters, not, not a whole lot, a little bit, and a little bit of information about uh, surge protection. Okay? Those are the things that users need to think about. There's also a little bit of information about traditional cost-benefit analyses so that users can think about the cost of power quality versus the cost of mitigation. Okay, to put try to put the economic um, uh, mentality in front of the end user. Okay. okay, so those the rest of the ones we're going to talk about have a little more. These are the ones now that you came here to listen to, to for us to talk about. 519. Okay, well, we all know what 519 is. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time in it, but I want to talk to you about kind of the high points. And these are some of the relatively recent changes that are in 519 that traditionally haven't been the case. In the 2014 edition, and I was the chair of the 2014 version of 519, we introduced the measurement 
protocols from IEC 61000-4-30. Before 2014, we had harmonic limits, but we didn't have any standardized way to measure. Wait, how can I require you to keep your harmonic current at or below a certain number and not specify how that number is going to be measured? You can't do that, but we did. We did it that way for 30 years, right? Okay? But in 2014, we stopped that, right? And of course, we didn't want to go and re reinvent a new measurement protocol now Triple E. IEC already had that, and we just started using it, okay? So that was a big, a big thing. We also, remember, I showed you those graphics. Disturbance levels change all the time, right? Well, wait a minute. If you're going to comply with with a, for example, a harmonic limit, does that do you does that mean you never ever ever go above whatever the limit number is? Never, maybe. Or does it mean well sometimes you can go above the limit, sometimes you can be below the limit? Well, maybe it means that. Okay. We adopted also the statistical characterization over a day and also over a week. Those were also principles from IEC. Up until 2014, we hadn't, we, we didn't do any of that. Right? I don't know, for example, exactly how you know what how you may be implementing those types of things, you know, here in, in your way. Right? Something to think about. The voltage distortion, again, this is a standard table that, that we have. The only relatively new thing here is the addition of another row. We traditionally have had, uh, let's see, we, did, we traditionally had three rows in this table. These two were combined together. So anything less than 69 kV, you had an individual maximum individual harmonic of 3%. Now, wait a minute. Anything less than 69 kV, that goes all the way down to LV. Right? For the US, that would be 120 volts at, at the output. There's no way that if I allow 3% in medium voltage, there's no way that I'm going to be, I'm also going to have 3% at LV. Uh, it's going to be more healthy, right? That that's reality. And so, in 2014 addition, we split that and added that DLB category. Okay, these others are the same as as the ones we traditionally had. What about interharmonics? Now, especially for my company in Alabama, we have seven arc furnaces. Each one is uh, 100 megawatts or more. Okay, and seven. Our furnaces are major producers of interharmonics. Okay, more and more and more in use equipment also is producing interharmonics. A switching converter that is not switching synchronized to the power frequency will produce interharmonics. Okay. We still don't have limits for interharmonics in 519 that are what we call normal. They're not requirements yet, because interharmonics is a tough, tough situation from a technical perspective. But we are beginning to propose interharmonic voltage limits. Okay? Right now, interharmonic limits in lower frequencies are based on flicker, light flicker. Incandescent lamp flicker. Okay. But what about higher frequencies? Well, higher frequency disturbances don't cause an incandescent lamp to flicker. It, it does, but our eyes can't see it. Okay. So in effect, it does. But does that mean that at higher frequencies, interharmonics don't need limiting? No. Okay. Maybe. In the United States, that, that might be more true, but a lot of countries, especially countries in Europe and countries in like Australia and New Zealand, for sure, a lot of countries use ripple control. Okay, basically we're using the utility system as a low frequency communication channel. Right? Hmm. We 
better make sure that we don't allow emissions from some kind of inner harmonic to interfere with that. So the initial concept that we're thinking about for inner harmonic limits is around the power frequency, base the limits on light flicker. For higher frequency inner harmonics, base the limits on acceptable levels to avoid interference with ripple control. <clears throat> You may know that historically 519 has been intended to apply to consuming installation. 519 has been around since 1992. All right. In 1992, we didn't have to think too much about generating equipment producing harmonics. Uh, a singer's machine doesn't produce very many harmonics. Okay? That's not true anymore. And now we got all kinds of generating technology produces all kinds of harmonics. Do the limits in IEEE 519, do they apply, for example, to a PWM inverter? Well, probably not, but that was all we had for a long time. Not anymore. We're going to talk about the two documents in IEEE that apply to generating equipment just a minute. But if we've got something else that's going to apply to generating equipment, what does 519 apply to and how do we determine that? Many facilities in the United States have both consuming equipment and producing equipment. Okay? That's pretty common. So if, if somebody consumes energy during the day and produces energy at night, are they a consumer or a producer? How, you know, how do you decide that? All right, so we created a kind of a, a logic flow diagram, and we simply determined whether or not 519 is applicable. Okay, so the, the bottom line of the question is, is the total rated generation in a facility, okay, is the total generation in the facility less than 10% of the maximum annual demand of the facility, okay? So we basically say that 519 is going to apply if you've got, if you're capable of producing 10% of your energy required, okay, 10% or less. If you can produce more than 10% of your energy needs, then you're gonna be considered to be a producer and other limits, other documents are going to apply to you, okay? And that's a huge issue when it comes to standardization because the limits are very different. Okay? Very different. So this is this this decision tree, if you will, is a is pretty significant. As far as the current distortion limits, you may be aware that in IEEE 519, there are actually three of these tables, and these tables simply give limits for individual harmonics and total distortion amounts, right? Depending on the size of the user with respect to the short circuit capacity and depending on the interconnection voltage. Right? This is just one of the three tables. There's nothing, nothing new about these. Okay. That's, that's the existing 519 as far as harmonics are concerned and a couple of the, the relevant changes. What about voltage fluctuation? All right. Well, for a long time, and I sure believe we didn't have anything for voltage fluctuations. And we began to learn about the work that had been done by the International Union for Electro Heat, UIE which led to the creation of the IEC flicker meter and all the IEC flicker related standards. Right? For a long time, we didn't have anything. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So in the late 90s and early 2000s, we did a couple of things in IEEE. The first thing we did is we adopted outright the IEC flicker meter. Right? Then 
Once we had something we could measure and quantify voltage fluctuations in terms of light pressure, once we had that, then we needed some utility management practices. So we turned next and adopted outright IEC technical report 61000-3-7, which prescribes the limiting process for voltage fluctuations in liquor. Now, we got ourselves in trouble because there were a few people in the IEEE community of standards that really understood the IEC flicker meter and flicker principles in general. There were a few of them. Right? Yes, it's true. I was involved and actually was the chair of 519 in 20, for the, the 2014 edition. That, that, and a lot of people know that about me. But in truth, my personal expertise is in this. And this is my actual expertise. And I was one of those people that pushed this really hard. But the user community, the utility community in the U.S., they were willing. They they were willing to accept it, but nobody knew how to use it. We didn't. Nobody had the level of understanding that I did, and there were not just me only, but a small group of people, right? But all of the utility companies in the United States can't hire that small group of people over and over and over. That's not going to work. So we needed to develop more of a user guide. Right? A lot of information existed across Europe about how to use the flicker meter and you know what PST means and, and all that kind of stuff. The U.S. community didn't know that stuff. We could adopt the documents and we did, but how do we use them? So we needed to make Now, is that, I got it. All right, sorry. 
Okay. The main takeaway here, the main contribution for chapter six, all right, the biggest one is this third subbullet. <clears throat> Clicker, as you probably, voltage fluctuations, as you're well aware, voltage fluctuations are the result of all network users operating together. Right? A major issue when it comes to anything associated with Flickr management and Flickr limits is to fit, to determine who's doing what. You know, because if you go and measure a voltage, you're measuring the result of everybody. Who's doing what? If you want to give a customer a Flickr limit, okay, there are procedures in IEC 61003-7 gets it to do that, that, that. You can do that. So you give a customer a, a flicker limit. And then you go and you measure flicker. But the flicker that you measure is the combined effect of everybody. So how do you assess whether or not a particular customer complies with the limit that you gave? You can't measure that. You know, what are you going to do? Well, there's a couple of choices, a couple of options that are given in 1453. And they're broken down based on whether or not the existing background flicker is low or whether it's high. If it's a low level of background flicker, then it is recommended, meaning it would be okay if you simply use the summation law to separate pre-connection flicker from the post-connection flicker. And in so doing, you can identify the contribution of the individual user. That only works if the existing background flicker level is low. If the background flicker level is high, what do you do then? Well, what's in 1453, this is a case to where I don't personally agree with this, but What's in the document is if background flicker levels are high, then assess an individual customer's contribution based on simulating the so-called fictitious grid. Now, if you're familiar with the IEC uh, 61400 part 21 document, the you know, power quality for wind turbines, that's where that comes from. Right? That's the, the IEC recommendation for assessing not just flicker, but power quality effects in general for, for wind turbines. Right? And that is a very tricky thing to do. It looks, it looks kind of simple, but getting it right is, is not simple at all. Okay. Right? So it did, did but. Right? I don't agree with it, but that, that's not the point. I'm just one person, okay? This is what's in 1453. But, but of course, from if a utility company is going to adopt the flicker meter and limits based on IEC, then you got to have some way to assess compliance. It, these, these are realities, okay? And before 1453, the U in the U.S. in the IEEE arena, we didn't have these kinds of uh, recommendations for utility engineers, right? So 1453 made a pretty good con contribution. Also, rapid voltage changes. What is a rapid voltage change? Well, the best way to think about a rapid voltage change is it's a change in RMS voltage, and, and it occurs often enough to think about, but it doesn't occur often enough to produce objectionable clicker. Okay? Don't we need to manage those, those kinds of events? Yeah, yeah, we do. Okay? Well, there are recommended rapid voltage limits in IEC 61,037, so the fact we adopted that in IEEE, we got it covered, but the coverage in 61003-7 doesn't really apply, particularly in the U.S., to our the way we are interconnecting, especially solar. 
Yeah. The typical practice in the U.S. is for when the when the solar installation is disconnected for whatever reason, it's the the transformer between the utility and the entire solar facility is open. Well, that in itself is not a real big problem. The issue comes when maybe five minutes later, the, the solar farm wants to come back online and here comes that transformer. Okay, and that happens. Certainly, it, it, energization is every morning, okay? And if the solar conditions or the economic conditions are not suitable for operation, the farm comes off. Maybe an hour later, they have an energy bid accepted. Here comes that transformer again. Okay. So over the course of a few days, we have, not, not a few days, over the course of one day, we're likely to have multiple transformer energization for each of our each solar facility. Right? And because of that inrush, we get so-called rapid voltage change. That doesn't happen often enough to produce light flicker. Okay, but we don't want those kinds of regular large voltage changes. And that wasn't covered in the IEC, and it's still not. So one of the things that we put into 1453 is more guidance on how to manage that type of low power quality issue. Okay, now, not only that, but because that was driven by our concern with interconnection of inverter-based resources like solar farms, okay? I believe 2800, which we're about to talk about, is our document for interconnected IBR generating resources to the transmission HVHV system. Okay, this is where it's a problem. So we made sure that what was in 1453 is consistent with 2800. <clears throat> As far as predicting flicker, flicker's great. We can go measure PST after the system's operating and all the customers are doing whatever. But how do we predict it ahead of time? Okay. Well, there are existing ways to do this, particularly coming from the Eurozone. But we didn't have those, we didn't have that in our AAA. Okay. So when we were putting 1453 together, we went out, we made a collection of all these different resources, and we included ways to predict the flicker effects, shape factors developed by the IEC and published in 61033 and in 37. Right? Shape factors, we brought those over and educated, you might say, the U.S. community on, on how to use them. We have, and certainly in Alabama and U.S. in general, we have quite a few art furnaces. They're major sources of flicker. There are, there are simplified ways to predict the PST flicker production or effect of an art furnace. It's called a KST factor. All right? For sure, almost uh, for us in Alabama, any new furnace customer, by default, they have to come with compensation. Right. Well, different compensation technologies have different, known different effects as far as their mitigation effectiveness, okay? so-called reduction factors. The U.S. community didn't know anything about any of that, and so in 1453, we tried to put that kind of practical application-oriented material. Okay? Okay, now let's talk about the generators. Okay? In IEEE, we have two different power quality documents that relate to generating facilities. And the, the, the difference is in IEEE 1547, that's the applicable document for generating facilities that are interconnecting to our medium voltage, what we call our distribution. Okay? IEEE 2800, which you look, which is the next one we'll talk about, is the document that that uh, gives the limits for generating facilities that are connecting into what we call our transmission HVHV stuff. Right. So 1547 
because it's connected to, to lower voltages, tends to be applicable to smaller generating equipment. All right. There is no size limit given in 1547. All right. But because the interconnection is on distribution, it's inherently limited from a practical perspective. Okay, well, as you might imagine, and I don't, you, you may have never even looked at 1547 or 2800 years, okay? But these, these documents, they're big. And these are documents that describe the, the requirements for interconnecting generation equipment to a utility company. There's all kinds of things to worry about. Ride through voltage support, reactor support, you know, grounding in and out, you know, ramp rates, all that kind of stuff. And all of those things are considered in 1547. But we're only talking about power quality. Only one, uh, there's one chapter in 1547 that talks about power quality. And then there's an annex in the back that gives a little bit more information. So just thinking about those two. From the perspective of voltage fluctuations and flicker, all right? Well, flicker limits are given in terms of PSD and PLD. Every generating, every generator interconnecting to our distribution system is allowed a flicker limit, a short-term severity limit PSD of 0.35, a long-term flicker severity PLT limit of 0.25, period, done. In, in end of story, okay? Is that what we should do? Probably not. Is that the best thing? Probably not. That's what it is today, okay? Uh, as far as rapid voltage change, now remember, a major consideration for us was the energization over and over and over of the interconnecting transform, okay? So it's, it's kind of natural to have reasonable rapid voltage change limits. So if the interconnection is at our medium voltage, then the change in voltage has to be 3% or less. If the interconnection is at our low voltage, okay, generally less than 1 kV, then the voltage change has to be less than 5%. Okay? Now, for us, medium voltage, it implies distribution. Low voltage implies utilization. So what does that mean? Medium voltage implies it's something interconnected to the utility company medium voltage feeder. Low voltage implies it's something like I'm putting solar panels on my roof of my house. Okay? That's, that's kind of the practical interpretation of that. Okay. Uh, we also have, in addition to these instantaneous or step change limits, we also have the same numbers that are defined as far as ramp rates are concerned. Okay, so these same percentages cannot be exceeded in terms of ramp rate as a percentage change per second, right? <clears throat> Harmonics, we only, in 1547, we only give limits for the harmonic current emissions, okay? These are the individual harmonic limits. Now, it's interesting, two things about this are interesting. One thing is this, row, this is the most restrictive row of all of the rows in 519, right? This is the most restrictive. Another thing to notice about this is that when it comes to generating equipment, it turns out that the harmonic, uh, the harmonic emissions from an inverter tend to be sensitive to things like imbalance in the connected supply voltage. So for a little bit of unbalance, inverters begin to produce a disproportionate amount 
of non-traditional even order harmonics. Right? What happens with number five and number seven that one? Ah, H le less than 11. Okay, wait. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what we did to recognize this potential sensitivity of inverters to imperfections in the, the interconnecting voltage, we, we relaxed the even order harmonic limits just a little bit, okay? If you look at this row in 519, the even order harmonics are limited to 25% of these, okay? For the second, yes, we're keeping it at 25%, but for the fourth harmonic, it's 50%, okay? For the sixth harmonic, 75%. Right? And again, that came not from us in the utility arena expertise, but the power electronic manufacturing community. Yeah, those were recommendations and things they wanted. And so, okay, that's where that came from. So, but in general, this is very similar to 519. This is the most restrictive row. Now, what that's telling us is, is that, okay, if I'm a utility company, Maybe, maybe I'm required by law to accept your energy. Maybe I have to buy it from you. Okay. But I don't want to buy bad energy. I want to buy quality energy from you. And so I want to hold you to the most strict standards. Okay. And that's the reason why this is the most restrictive row in all of 519, okay? Because we're paying money for this energy. We have, I wouldn't go buy a new car and pay money for a bad car. I want a good car. I want good quality if I'm paying for it. All right, another thing. Does a PWM inverter, is it? Uh, under ideal condition, does a PWM converter produce if harmonic? No, not at all. PWM, PWM inverters produce harmonics at high frequencies, really high frequencies. That's one of their big advantages. Oh, so I'm going to hook an inverter to the power system. It's going to produce a lot of harmonic distortion, but it's at high frequencies. Frequencies potentially way above the 50. What am I going to do about that? Mm, that, that? That's a challenge. Well, one of the ways that we're trying to manage higher frequency disturbances in the IEEE community is by changing the concept of total harmonic distortion from total harmonic <laughs> distortion to just total distortion. Right? What's the difference? Well, total harmonic distortion is based on existing traditional harmonics, which are multiples of the power frequencies 50 hertz, 100 hertz, 150, 200, and so forth. Right? But, but what, what about disturbances at frequencies that are not 50, 100, 150, 200? What if it's 187 hertz? What are we going to do with that? Ignore it? I hope not. Right? Well, so what we've come up with is this concept of total distortion. And the total distortion is based on the difference between the RMS value of the current and the power frequency term. Right? Whatever that difference is represents the distortion at whatever frequency or frequencies it may occur. Right? So that's a that's a significant difference in the newer IEEE power quality documents as far as harmonics are concerned. And it got started with 1547. In IEEE 20, the next version of IEEE 519 will have something like this. Right? Okay? All right, it's called total rated distortion. Well, obviously, all of these things are percentages, but percentage of what? 
They're always taken as percentage of the rated generating equipment cost. They're not considered, limits are not assessed based on a percentage of output at a particular point. They're always assessed based on a percentage of the rated capability of the equipment. Okay? So that's, not, that's the reason we call it total rated distortion, because in the denominator, of course, is the rated curve. Okay, that's 1547. Now, 2800, this is our newest power quality document, if you will. This is the one that applies to generating equipment that's connected into the transmission system. This is the bigger stuff, okay? Light 1547. This is a huge document. It specifies a lot of requirements for generating equipment. Only a piece of this has anything to do with power quality. There's one chapter and then an annex. <clears throat> as far as voltage, voltage fluctuations and flicker are concerned, well, the traditional PST flicker limits in 2800 are the same as they were in 1547. Okay? Short term flicker severity of 0.35, long term flicker severity 0.25. Should it be that? No. No way. But that's what it is. Okay? There's a lot of reasons why it is that way here in, in this document. It's very difficult to to make a standard that gives one number. And so these are very, very conservative values, okay? And, and this would significant, significantly underutilize any system's ability to absorb uh, voltage flux, uh, fluctuation or flicker disturbance, okay? It's way too conservative. Okay, but it is what it is, okay? Uh, let's see, as far as RVCs are concerned, now, for 2800, the interconnection voltages are higher. We're talking about transmission now. So the frequent rapid voltage changes are limited. The step change is less than it was in 1547, so 2.5% rather than 3. Okay? And also, we defined in 2800 a distinction between so-called frequent rapid voltage changes and infrequent rapid voltage changes. Now, what frequency, that kind of implies time. You know, and when I read something like this, frequent, okay, it occurs five times a day or 10. You know, that's when I hear frequent or unfrequent, that's kind of what I think about. No, that, we didn't do it that way. Frequent or infrequent is defined by the type of event. For example, a transformer inter, inrush event associated with normal operation of the equipment or the facility, that's considered a frequent event. An outage for maintenance or something like that, some kind of equipment change or configuration <laughs> change, that's considered an infrequent event. So it's the type of the event rather than the, its rate of occurrence. That's a little bit confusing, but particularly for us, the wind industry wanted to make that distinction. Okay, so from the utility perspective, obviously standardization is always a give and take. We can't say, oh, we're the utility company, you have to do it our way. It's always you know, a compromise. Right? This is an example of that. As far as the harmonics are concerned, now, in this case, because 2800 deals with everything, with, with the whole range of potential transmission interconnection voltages, right? We have three rows, right? For lower voltages in the transmission range, for the, the intermediate voltages in the transmission range, and in the higher voltages in the transmission range. As you might guess, the higher the interconnection voltage, the more restrictive the limits. 
And guess what about these numbers? Remember I told you that 519 has three tables of current limits, depending on the interconnection voltage. This row is the most restrictive row in that 519 current table. This row is the most restrictive limit in that 519 current table. And that one, okay, you get the point. Okay, this also is the most restrictive. We're making the same um, uh, compromises with regard to the effect of the even order harmonics that we talked about before. We're also, because we recognize that generation tends to be inverter based, PWM higher frequency, okay? We're using the same concept of total rated distortions, trying to capture the higher frequency type effects. <clears throat> Oh, one, uh, this point down here in this box, this, this is this is this is potentially problematic. One of the things that we had to include in 2800, we when I say we from the utility perspective, we had to accept from the inverter manufacturers this little box, the implications of this. When, when the interconnection is into the power system where there are where there are significant unbalance, then the current limits have to be allowed to increase. The inverter manufacturers insisted on this. Well, okay, but what how do the current limits change? The way it's written for every 1% increase above 2%, okay? So 2% unbalance or below, that this applies, as is. But if this goes from 2% to 3%, every 1% increase in unbalance, these numbers, double, okay? This goes up 1%, those go up 100%. This goes up 2%, those go up 200%. What? What? This seems like this, this, this seems to be unfair. It seems this seems to be ridiculous. Take to be bothered. Yeah, I it, it, this is draconian. <clears throat> So it is severity, but it was there was we didn't have in the utility industry, we didn't have the expertise or the practical measurement data to, to stop that. Nobody liked it, but we couldn't support, we couldn't let's say argue against it because we couldn't we couldn't make we couldn't support. Not agreeing with it. Of course, we don't want to agree with it. It does. It seems much, much, much too, uh, let's say, uh, severe. Much too much of a penalty. But we didn't have the we didn't have the knowledge. We didn't have the expertise. We didn't have access to the data uh, to to push against it. But so right now, that's there. That. Will that be in there in the next version of 2800? Probably not, because even now, there's, I'm running one project, and I know there's another one in another company where we are trying to collect this data. We are trying to do these assessments and back them up with simulations and all this kind of stuff to fight against this. We need, this needs to change, but it's there now. Okay. In practical terms, is it usual to cover an unbalanced higher than two percent in transmission times? No, no, it's not. But the thing about it is, for us, for us in US, if you notice, I'm about to go to the next slide, which I think is the last slide, and so we will have done all these slides, and I haven't showed you a document associated with unbalanced. Well, I haven't showed you one because there's not one. 
So if there's not one, then what does two percent even mean? You know, I, of course we would all like to think two percent is a ratio of negative to positive sequence, right? But that's that's the easy part, you know. What I mean? Because it's not constant, you know. How you gonna measure it? And all that kind of stuff. And how those, let's say, how those definitions play out over time, it might be that ultimately how unbalanced is assessed, that the assessed number, maybe it can get more than 2%. Traditionally, the way we would think about it, no, it probably is not. But if it is assessed in some, let's say, unusual or some different way, maybe we get a, a different number. That's 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 our concern from the utility perspective, because that it is not yet defined or standardized what that is and how we measure it. Is it a percentile or an absolute or what? Until those things are answered, this makes us very nervous. This is a limit of voltage unbalance uh -huh. for the ability. Well, so, so uh, the, the generation uh, equipment has limitation of unbalance of injection of current. Mm -hmm. Because if you you can reduce the unbalance because you inject unbalanced current. That's right. So yeah, there exists a limit of the people that inject current that they must be balanced. Yeah, it, and but again in today in in the IEEE arena we don't have yet we don't yet have, have let's say an unbalanced document. You know okay. we we got 519 for you know traditional harmonics and we've got you know the 1453s for the voltage fluctuations and things like that. But we don't we don't have anything for unbalanced. Yes, each utility company and what we call each, of course, in, in the US, the, the regulation is on a state basis. So of course, you know, we got 50 states, each state has a has a regulator. All right. And in general, the regulations in each state are at least a little bit different. Right? They're similar, but not the same. Well, each utility company has to file a rules governing electric service document with, with the regulator. You have to do that every year. And in, we just refer to it as the rules. So in the rules, we have to specify, for example, what our level of unbalance is, our maximum level is going to be. Right? And we have been specifying. Uh, and I don't, as long as I've been alive, we've been specifying 5%. Okay. Five, five. five. And almost every other utility company has been doing that as well. Now, does that mean we have 5% on transmission? No. no. We probably regularly have that on our medium voltage distribution because of the way we operate our medium voltage much more similar to the way you operate low voltage. You know, because on our medium voltage, we have lots and lots and lots of users connected phase to neutral. Single phase, phase to neutral customers. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Right? So of course, this unbalanced thing is we're we have we have an IEEE group that's that let's say is working with this, but we still got a ways to go, right? And so this is a scary thing. But so far, anyway, going back to these the two projects that are trying to look at the correlation between unbalanced level and uh, current emissions, it does seem that there is some linear dependence on, uh, on traditional harmonic emissions based on unbalance. So there, it does make sense, or it seems to make sense that if unbalanced level goes up, then okay, maybe that should go up. But it, it, it doesn't appear to be anywhere close to go 100%. That seems to be very, 
uh, much too much. But it's a, that's a work in progress. But almost, I, I thought we were done. This is, I think this is the last one. Okay, what about voltage distortion? There are no voltage distortion limits given in 2800. There were no voltage distortion limits given in 1547. In 1547, there wasn't even any discussion of voltage distortion. In 2800, there is, okay? But no numbers are provided. It's left up to each utility company for each interconnection to determine and specify limits on voltage distortion that can be produced by an inverter-based resource interconnection. And that determination has to consider two things. The classical harmonic voltages that would be produced by the operation of the inverter. All right, and that would be a case to where, okay, the inverter produces harmonic currents. When those harmonic currents flow through the utility impedance, that will create harmonic voltages at the point of common code. That's the traditional thing. But if the utility company has background voltage distortion, which is certainly true, right, depending on the frequency dependent impedance characteristics between the utility supply and the end use facility, there's going to be a voltage division of these background harmonics that shows up at the point of common cover. And in the case of some kind of resonance between these two impedances, the voltage harmonics here could be actually magnified versions of the existing background harmonics, okay? And the utility company needs to take that into account to specify limits for the generating facility, right? Obviously, this kind of effect would be completely dependent on the interconnection location. There's no way to generalize that, okay? What are utility com companies doing in the U.S.? Most utility companies, I mean, our company, our company is big, right? Okay? We have maybe four or five, five engineers that have a lot of the power quality experience to do stuff like this. Most companies in the U.S. are much smaller and, and don't have that experience, right? And, so what are they going to do? Most utilities in the U.S. are just going to do that. This one, this is in 2800, and I guess it's good to have it there, but to try to do this accurately and defend it, especially considering that this is going to also be a contingency-based number, that you're going to go off to hunt in impedance polygons and things like that, this is going to be a very involved process. Most companies are not going to do that. But most of us stay over there in the traditional way. This impedance will be nothing other than short circuit impedance, and that's that. Okay? That's probably how companies are going to implement. Just because of a lack of, of um, expertise. Okay, now this is it. I, I knew we were on. So, uh, as far as kind of concluding all this, I mean, Remember, we started this with Emma book. We kind of started from our knowledge of the fact that equipment was going to respond poorly to SAGs. Okay. We, we knew about SAGs. We knew about how to measure them. And we were comfortable talking about SAGs from, with, with a metric, with an index. Right? And those indexes came originally from the reliability fees. Right? SARP is a good example of those early indices. Obviously, we don't use SARP and SAGs, but we were comfortable when thinking about SAGs and momentary outages and stuff like that. So having a metric. Right? Well, as the systems, power system, and the connected equipment sensitivities and complexities increase, we already had a roadmap. Identify what the sensitivity is, okay, and get a metric 
to quantify the conditions in the system. All right. No matter what the disturbance is, it started with SAG, but it, we've come a long way since then. But the process that that we've used has been has been the same. Well, it started with 1100. We don't use simple outage metrics anymore. If we talk about distortion, the metric we use is based on classical theory, like you know, Fourier stuff or harmonics. When it came to voltage fluctuations, we didn't know how to quantify voltage fluctuations. So what did we do? Well, the International Union for Electrical Heat, UIE, came up with the flicker meter to quantify, to give us an index, a metric, a measure to, quant to quantify the characteristics of our supply system. And we can compare the characteristics of the supply with the sensitivity of the equipment, make investments and decisions so that we keep those statistical distributions as far apart as is economically feasible. Okay? We've been doing that for a long time. We make our limits somewhere in the middle. Right? So we do that, like I said, we do that same kind of thing regardless of what the disturbance is. And so with that, I think I'm done. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to come and share these things with you. I mean, I again, there's 10,000 pages of things in all these documents. If you've got questions, by all means, ask them. We can talk about them as long as we want to talk about them. I was just trying to plant seeds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation. It was really clear. And the final discussion, discussion about the the change of the limited the limits of the harmonic curing depending on the balance uh, voltage was very really, very very interesting. Add to for me. It's time for questions. Any questions? Are there, maybe there's some on the maybe preguntas in the chat. Uh, you uh, can use also the microphone. It can allow that. Is free to I don't see anything in the chat. People who have joined Zoom are allowed to put their comments or questions on the chat. Which one of these is weird? I don't know. It's the same for me. There's no idea how we share. We share. There's no idea. We have to go in the chat. I think uh, for me that I should be working hard the last 10 years. Um, um, you use a lot of information for IEC. Mm -hmm. It's good, really. Uh, and also, I think that is a good idea to make recommendations for engineers because really the standards is okay. We need pressures to measure, to have an index to follow. But at the end of the day, we need recommendations for people that apply that information. That's why. So uh, I studied this. Subject 20 years ago. And in that moment, I believe it was a little uh, the back. Mm -hmm. They have some recommendation, but IEC was part of it. That's right. I, I feel that you are running from the back, but <laughs> it's okay. And certainly, as I have. I, I, as a, from my personal perspective, and when I got started with, as a, I guess, as a professional engineer, I got with IEEE and worked through 
through IEEE for many, many years. And when I got the opportunity to get involved in IEC, then I really began to see both sides. And I always, I always wanted to, to, to try to, to, to stop having different, different sets of standards for the same problem, you know? And for goodness sakes, if something already exists, and the flicker meter is a great example. The flicker meter already existed in IEC. And in IEEE, there was no reason to try to reinvent that. Just, just use it. it that's, it's okay. You know, but some people can't, some people can't accept that there is no good reason for 50 and 60 hertz. Okay. You know, it's that same mentality. I don't know what that mentality is, but there's something wrong with it. Okay. Any other questions or discussions? You think? <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay, the origin of the difference between people and six, there was bigger, bigger and hard dams. Mm -hmm. They are very different in Europe and the US. It is an interpretation. Because the discussion with what's my between my computer. Sí, la presentación la pasamos, sí, sí. No, 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 pero el aporte es la, la grabación. Igual eso te va, te va a llegar un mail después. Eh, te va a llegar a vos un mail por el inicial. Ah, perfecto.